Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Chimpreneurship. This is a weekly Chimpers production which takes place every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern time at the moment. So you can put that right into your calendars. We'll be hosting some of the most talented, most successful, most entrepreneurial builders and leaders in the space every single week. If you do not know already, my name is BJ. I'm your host for the show. I'm joined, of course, by the epic founding team of Chimpers. We have uh, insights to Joey and Timpers in the house with us. Speaking of Timpers, he's designed a PO app for today, which you can claim at the end of the show. So stay tuned until the end to get hold of one. It includes our special guest today, and we'll get you entered into a raffle for some Chimpers NFTs at the end of season two, which will be next week. Uh, so only one more week left of collecting the power ups make sure you collect them all uh just before we start now we're delighted to shout out our sponsor for season two seed world created by seedify studios it represents a new era in the metaverse landscape the platform will be fully centered around user-generated content offering a unique blend of creative freedom and digital innovation we'll hear more from seed world a little later but now to our special guest today it gives me great pleasure to welcome them to the stage with us. He is an illustrator, comic artist, toy designer, author, and creator of Ugly Dolls and Bossy Bear. Our special guest today is David Horvath. Welcome, David. How are you doing? And are you ready for some chimpreneurship? Thank you very much for having me. It's very much a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, the POAP is awesome. Uh, I, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, Timpers and the you know, pixel art is so at least for me, it's very difficult <laughs> to, to to even approach. I can't imagine being the master of it, uh, which that's what we're seeing once again here. So it's, it's a thrill. Thank you. I love it. I'm really looking forward to this conversation because we have a lot of conversations, uh, obviously of well, of the entrepreneurial uh, style, because that's kind of what we're trying to focus on here. But I don't think we've spoken to any any like artists themselves we've spoken to a lot of builders like nft community leaders and those types of things but i'm really interested to hear the perspective of someone uh, who's built successful businesses as an artist first and foremost and then obviously as a businessman at the same time so really interested to hear uh, your perspective as we go through this conversation uh, you mentioned tempers just before we start maybe like what's what's the connection there like i guess you guys as artists have connected at some point in the history of web3 at some point yes uh we i i started well i i, I had no idea what web3 was uh up to february of 2021 and then stumbled onto um uh what was it called clubhouse originally before we had Ooh. Twitter spaces, right and um okay. it was actually the guy who heads up uh my my uh, someone i've known for a while who heads up um san rio in the u.s um this fellow craig and uh, very talented we were talking about something entirely different and i was talking about how i could never offer original artwork um to anyone who would want to collect it like my wife puts up these canvases we get invited to do these gallery shows at giant robot and other places uh benetton in hong kong and she puts up these amazing uh canvases and i always had to sort of put a print and then maybe the original drawing that the print would, then I would then scan and color. I could never really offer the final original to whoever might want it. And um, so he wrote to me like, remember how you used to say you can't do that? Well, now you 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 can. Uh. And I was like, well, that's nonsense. And then, so, <laughs> well, no, check out this website, Nifty Gateway. And then from there, you know, just went down the same rabbit hole we all did in one way or another. And um, I, I remember Timpers was a very early contact. Uh, I love um, the, the the artwork, <laughs> immediately drawn to it as so many of us are. And um, I, I think we, we may even have had our very first conversations surrounding nouns early on. Uh, you know, there was really, it was like back then, one day felt like a month. And if you, you know, took two days off, felt like you were on a very extended vacation. So, um, I just, I, I, I associate everything chimpers with those early days and those early moments of me going from whatever was happening before I was doing any of this that we're all now collectively after to, to being here with all of you. That's, uh, that's so fun. That's such a nice kind of uh, reflection. Uh, when you look back, I mean, we'll, we'll get into kind of your 
previous history as well before you even entered the space but when you look back to kind of those early moments of experimentation in web3 like what are your key reflections even now that you've been in it for some time i i, I remember like there were these um like in the disney movie inside out there's these core memories <laughs> uh that you know very specific moments that um either retain their fruity color or become blue or darker over time. Uh, but I, I remember the moment when OpenSea decided to include the floor price on the collection sort of masthead. I think, I don't know what you really call it, but you know, when you go to the collections main page and you see all the, um, the statistics and one of them was floor. I, I remember when that, like, I didn't even really understand fully why they would want that up there. Right. And I remember they changed it so that um, by default, the newest artwork would not automatically come first. Because I was starting to build narratives where it was really important for me that when you find that the OpenSea landing page, that the most recent one is first. So all these little funny things I was worried about back then, not really realizing. Um, and, and, I, and I was pretty clueless about the idea of. Um, uh, flipping, I, I, you know, I thought it was more like, uh, and it may end up becoming more like the comic book industry or the, you know, the toy industry where, you know, like in the nineties, if you went outside of any Toys R Us, Target, Walmart, Kmart location in North America, um, doesn't matter if you were in the middle of nowhere in Texas or New York or Los Angeles, you'd see between two to 10 to a hundred collectors outside the door of every single location, no matter what. Wow. Uh, and, and they're all waiting so that they can run in. They, they're all friendly. As soon as the doors open, they're after each other's necks. Try to get the few action figures that are new that they can flip. And it was weird. It wasn't like, well, I thought old Star Wars figures were valuable, but it was the, whatever it was, the newest one you know, that they could flip immediately. And then as that, uh, you know, the Emperor is out. So that one's 20 bucks instead of four. And then uh, Emperor's like a year old. You can get him now. Yeah. And, and it kind of reminded me, right? Reminded me, me of, reminded me of that for a while. Like, wow, it's it's sort of similar. But but that's not that does not embody the entire toy industry. That's not even the entire action figure category, right? Which is mostly kids. Um, you know, even I I was actually speaking to the previous CEO of uh, Hasbro, and he said, yeah. Our, our adult collector market has grown to like 25% of, you know, what we make on, uh, on Star Wars and these other, these other action figure brands, but kids are still. So I, I sort of think of Web3 as where ultimately perhaps the sort of flipping and um, the bags dynamic will always be there, but we'll maybe, maybe like in comics, the com same thing, comic book covers in the 90s were, you know, everyone was flipping and trying to get the, the the rare variant covers it just reminds me of a lot of a lot of that and even the designer toy movement of the early 2000s mm. um, lots of that where you had collectors sending in people who didn't even know where they were just to go like you know one collector would get 50 people outside and give them 20 bucks each to go stand in these lines and you know <laughs> trying to figure out how to uh, yeah, so it, it reminds me a lot of that uh, i i I assume, I hope that someday the flipping will take like maybe a quarter of it and perhaps the other 75% will be, you know, what originally drew me to it, which was the, the ability to collect originals of digital art, you know, that, that was for me, the original appeal and, and some other creators who were drawn to that component immediately yeah, know, and have since left. I'm, I'm unable to leave. I, <laughs> pretty glued to all of it but uh it's fascinating to, to draw those comparisons maybe let's start we'll, we'll circle back to web3 and everything you've done here and why you're maybe unable to leave and what what's got you addicted but let's start with maybe the the stuff that you've done beforehand for the people who don't know what was your timeline like i mentioned a bunch of things in advance you, you know an illustrator comic artist toy designer i know you've been writing as well i noticed that you've been writing a substack as well which is maybe maybe ancillary or supportive to everything else but clearly creative across a number of levels like what's what's what was your story before uh web3 sure yes well the the substack ultimately will address you know much of what i mean the, the substack is not even really business advice i don't think legally i can even give business advice without <laughs> trouble 
but it's more like just I'm just writing out my internal dialogue, really. It's the things that I constantly think about on a loop in relation to what it is that we do, right? So um, early in early childhood, actually, I mean, I, 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 I set the goal was I, I wanted to make my own characters like, you know, very much inspired by Hello Kitty, you know, like, what, what from me, I remember in New York City, first experiencing Hello Kitty. And then right away, it was clear that this is not necessarily for children. Like my, my little sister had a little clear plasticky Hello Kitty purse and, you know, her friends had things from it, but something wasn't right like mm, mm, this is not this is not necessarily this is not for kids because kids don't like most of this stuff that i'm seeing right <laughs> and so why is this here where did it come from and then you know my parents would explain it away as oh but it's just it's from japan like mm, like well, well yeah but yeah but, but, but why and then just a foreign are? foreign reason <laughs> like don't worry about it uh so so i was very mm, that's who i wanted to go up against i wanted to go up against you know, Hello Kitty. How old yeah. were you then? Just out of interest. Uh, I think, I think real, I was in fifth grade, like around 11. It'd be pre that moment. It was like, you know, I, I wanted to make toys, but I didn't want to make, you know, Batman. I didn't want to make somebody else's toys. Right. Okay. Uh, and that, that's still true. Uh, you know, so I ultimately the goal was to make children's books and tell stories um, through consumer products, right. To make, um, character brands that were not from, you know, like uh, not a show. Like we, we, we wanted to make toys, but we were no, we had no interest in being in the toy business. Um, and, you know, I found out later that like all the, like the plush dolls that Sanrio makes, like they, half of their revenues come from plush dolls, but they're not in the toy business. And they, those are not toys, right? Those serve a very specific purpose. So once that clicked, and, and I noticed that they never write that down on paper. In fact, that's what my <laughs> Substack is, is because no one, there is no other source where this is put on paper. The, all those New York Times and Wall Street Journal articles about Hello Kitty, you know, with no mouth and the kawaii and all this stuff. And, oh, it's important, you know, the, the it's all nonsense. You know, it's like, it's like Sanrio, like, it's like Coca-Cola protecting the magic formula, you know, uh, the, the magic ingredients or, or whatever, any other business, right? You don't, you have a story, but you don't, you don't give away the magic formula. So, I, so I, you I, mentioned when you were very young, then that you had this idea, like, right, I, I love uh, the idea of creating characters, don't want to make other people's toys, uh, want to make your own. Then there must have been, then you said like certain things clicked on how other people were making toys, was there a big gap in between that? Like, what were you doing in your teens that either that facilitated you going after this dream? What was the gap between you actually started making it happen? Sure, yeah. In high school, I spent a lot of time downtown Los Angeles. There was a giant mall uh, called the Yahan Plaza, which I think if you go down there now, the building is called something else. But if you, like, work your way into the closed-off floors, you'll still – so it was it was a very bizarre mall. Like once you walk in, and I had never been to Japan at this point, but now now having spent so much time there, I realized it really was a Japanese mall, where even the tiled floor and the 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 way that mall was constructed was literally ripped out of what you would find at an Aeon mall that was built in the mid '90s. So bizarre now thinking back. But I I spent a lot of time at this one mall where they had a Japanese supermarket in the bottom floor, and then they had Japanese toy stores and arcades and uh, even furniture stores. Uh, they had like a little mini version of what, you know, you know, like Tokyo Hands. They had like something similar like that, right? It's and very eclectic from, a mix of things. It was really like going there in a way I didn't realize at the time. Uh, and I just spent a lot of time trying to figure out who all of this is for, because it's clear that, okay, Anpaman, this is for preschool. And okay, what ultimately became Power Rangers later was called something else. That's that's for I get it. These are like Mass Rider, Power Rangers boys, you know, and Tomika cars, right? And then oh, here's their kind of like their take on Barbie and and et cetera. Right. But then there was another layer. And I'm not talking about Dragon Ball or anime or or manga based product, but there were there were characters that just seemed like they were for adults, but they were not for adults to even collect that they were somehow there to then become a part of 
your life almost, right? Like that they became a part of your identity somehow. And then when I would look around in the mall, it seemed like that's the way that mostly adult women were interfacing with these things, that it wasn't like, I'm buying this to line up with my other ones. It was more that, you know, the, well, what I've come to understand is that the, the plush doll was kind of like the thing that brings you across from the other side of the room. And then you're finding that amongst that character on many other things that would actually either be useful to you or that you would use in your daily life or some sort of social signal like clip onto your bag or, or the bag. And then you could also buy the clip also. The things that just you would kind of slowly invite into being a just part of your regular day. And that once, once that clicked, that, that that's what I became kind of fascinated and obsessed with, really. Why, why do you think humans have that need to, to ex, is it, is it as a, a, an expression of themselves? Is it a need to connect with something that's not human and kind of created? What, what do you think is going on there? Yeah, I, well, I, I tried to, very hard to, to deconstruct the why. And I ended up with the where, uh, which is okay. perhaps a weird thing to say, but that I found that um, in many cases that it seemed like they were finding th these, these character objects or even other, other lifestyle goods, right? There, there are many that are not necessarily character-based, just that's the realm that I have the most interest in and that I felt that I might be able to, I, I'm never gonna design, um, an Eames chair, but I think I can turn a doodle on a napkin into something that belongs on an Eames chair, maybe. <laughs> but, um, so I, I began to identify, once I moved to New York to go to a school at, at Parsons in, in New York City, um, I, I started to see patterns that I wanted to make sure weren't just me hoping that that's how it was working, but that it seemed like people were going into certain places and at first I misinterpreted it as like cool stores or hip stores. And there are those, there are such things as those, mm. but it was, it was more specifically um, places that people uh, cared about or assigned some sort of meaning to. Like a friend of mine uses the term, uh, this place is my stomping ground. He's old. So he says stomping ground, right? <laughs> but like uh, my sister walks into like the MoMA store, you know, the, like the store from the museum, but but the one downtown in Soho. And she always say, oh, this place totally gets me, right? So, well, I don't think they know you exist, but okay. <laughs> right, but but that's something you, you I would hear a lot. Like, uh, this is my place, this place gets me. Interesting, uh, and that's uh, where uh, you came to that kind of where, where conclusion. Yeah, and then other people felt that way about a neighborhood comic book store or some design furniture store. Uh, you know, somewhere. And then my first trip to Japan in the uh, early, like 2002, I started to see that dialed up to number 11. And then right away, my first trip to South Korea, same thing. Um, but, it, but each in a different way, but really essentially sort of the same thing where there were these places that seemed important or that had some sort of importance to people. Like there was a magazine I was crazy about in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, Giant Robot. I was like, um, originally it was like an Asian American pop culture magazine, but they kept writing about stuff that I was very interested in. Uh, and artists that had nothing to do with Asian American pop culture, but just somehow got in there, right? And I was insanely crazy about Giant Robot. And then we, I don't know what it was, we moved to Los Angeles and then found out that Giant Robot was opening a store just down from where uh, we, we settled down. And when I went in there, I almost lost my mind. It was like, I felt like I was walking into a physical embodiment of the magazine. If I could, that, you know, especially if you're a massive fan of that specific magazine, you know, it has a, it has a feeling to it, right? We say vibes now, right? Yeah. yeah. There, were, there, were, there was a vibe to it that I probably would not be able to put on paper or explain it to you very well. But if I were to dr you know, drag you through the pages and then walk you through that place, you'd say, holy crap, I think we we are, you're right, we're walking through this place. So any any maniac who was growing up on Giant Robot Magazine would walk through there and, you know, 75, 80% of the people would just, I, I can't believe they pulled this off where I feel this way, right? It's, so really, it's really interesting because I guess a lot of people, particularly in this space now, and you've been at it 
way longer than any of us, but just looking at this from the Web3 perspective where people are really focusing on the creation of IP, um, the art, the kind of world that you are creating around it. But when you speak of it, you, you seem to tie a lot of the emotion in physical locations, like physical locations that really um, bring to life all of the things that you might have consumed in other forms, whether that's digitally, whether that's in a book, whether it's in a comic book or whatever. Yes. Do, do you think this space is missing something without that physical aspect or is it possible to purely digitally uh, recreate that emotion with your friends and other people who you do want to connect with and do enjoy the same IP as you, do enjoy those same worlds as you, or do, do you think that that physical aspect is something that can't be lost? Sure, yeah. I, I think that, well, it, it seems like a little bit of Web3 is sort of now discovering the importance, maybe, or uh, the usefulness or um, the alpha that it hovers around uh, being able to utilize the physical space, right, to then perhaps pull people back in towards... The, the, the digital origin, mm -hmm. you know, when, when we did walk through that giant robot store, um, they, they, they were one of like, they, they were one of the first magazines to ever write about Takashi Murakami. And so when I walked in there, they had Takashi Murakami plush that I didn't even know existed. Right. Mm -hmm. So I thought it's really important that we immediately put our first character goods here, because when you walk in there, you're feeling about giant robot, and then you're sort of going to assign that, feeling you're having to the things that are you know, that you're discovering there. Right. And, and then that was the formula. So I think that you can apply that formula in, in the digital space, uh, especially, you know, we're probably on the dial up version of what's coming, right? Like this is uh, I joke around, this is AOL compared to what's coming in my daughter's like, what, what uh, AOL, what do you mean? <laughs> what's that? But you know, like the, this feels like the, the 1.0 version of what's going to be possible. So I, I think that ultimately you'll be able to, you know, create digital spaces that sort of carry that same significance for, for people, uh, especially people who are growing up in, in the digital world. Um, that certain digital spaces may end up being their MoMA store or their giant robot, you know, the things that uh, have, uh, that, that are compelling emotionally and that have some sort of uh, importance to them. Um, but as of today, the physical space is still very, very powerful and, and useful. Um, so in, yeah. in, in, in your previous uh, work before Web3, then how did you kind of leverage that feeling or leverage that knowledge that you that seemed to click to you specifically, um, whether that's in the physical space or being able to turn your ideas of wanting to create characters into a successful business? Because I think that's one of the things everyone on Twitter now wants to be an expert of what all of these artists should be doing with their IP and how to expand and how to get more holders. And how did you do this pre web three in order to turn that character creation into a successful business? Yeah, it, it was, the formula is pretty simple where we had specific characters. Most of them are behind me mm -hmm. and we, started with a plush doll or a plastic figure, uh, something toyetic, but not, not a toy yeah. for children and not even really a collectible. Um, but the idea was that, you know, you would be able to hold the brand in your hand really was what it was like a, okay. a vehicle for an emotional connection. Right. And the goal was to be in a place that you already care about so that when you enter, we're hoping that you would then find us there. And so you're finding us there is kind of your idea. You know, we're not marketing to you. We didn't do any Got sort it. of, you know, we used to have a banner in our booth that was like for the trade show booths, like for the trade, not for public facing, but like for the licensing show, we'd have a funny poster, like no social media. And then we'd have the X through all the, like that we were able to do that without anything. And that was sort of the thesis and the formula that instead of broadcasting outwards, we would be a source of discovery that you would find us in places that hopefully you already cared about. And if we did it right and we did our homework and if you resonate with what we're making, that you might assign that feeling to us, right? And then the plush dolls there to kind of bring you over. But then you'd realize really quickly, oh, but there's a, 
there's a tote bag and there's wallets and there's, oh, I really could use a new wallet or like, oh, I, I can use this bag, like starting, you know, I can pay for it and take the tag off and use it right now. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then there was a little plush that you could hang that was meant to hang on the bag. Right. So just, just little, like a little program versus having just some item there on a shelf that you buy. And, you know, we, we definitely didn't want to be a, we didn't want to sell you a, a product, even though you're buying nothing but consumer products from us. Uh, we didn't want to be a thing on a shelf. We wanted to be something that you would invite into your, your life versus collect at your house, if that makes any sense. Got it. And um, what kinds of places, I think you said there something important, which is like, if you've done your research right and you've picked the right place, because the place again seems pretty important to you, for you specifically and for your uh, IP at the time, what ended up being like the right place for you? And it might not be the right place for everyone at all okay. times, but what was the right thing with your research back then? Uh, for us, the right places were... Um museum stores uh because it was it was oh, it was very easy like in new york city and in tokyo it's very easy to find really funky little shops everywhere they're everywhere especially back when we first started they were literally everywhere right and in tokyo is still very much like this where does that actually make it harder because they're everywhere or is it easier because it means you can get in somewhere but harder because there's more competition uh well the hard the hard part is to really learn the actual landscape of each city and sort of learn, learn the language of it. And then to identify like, okay, these may be a bunch of cool stores on Avenue A, but will these necessarily be that useful for us? And then, you know, making sure that if we're on Forbidden Planet on 14th Street and Broadway, um, that we try not to be on any, in, on any other window or in any other store for at least 10 block radius, you know, so that we're not you know, it actually became a concern quite quickly. So it was not just finding cool shops, um, although there are so many, but more the ones that would be more useful for us in, in the longer term. Like if, if we could actually get into these stores, like uh, so we, the, the, would, would these then be able to propel us for the longer term? Meanwhile, we were say like, you know, we, we had no money and we had a kid on the way and Walmart was coming after us, you know, which it was really a weird feeling to turn them down, you know, back then or at, at any time. Right. Um, it, it, I felt like I was already a bad father and I had a kid wasn't even born yet. Right. So it, it, it was really it, suddenly we went from trying to figure out which little funny, cool stores to be in to, Oh, do we genuinely believe that this can last for decades? Uh, because that's the decision we're now making right now, like right now, you know, what, what, why did it move so quickly? Yeah, every year. Like what happened to make it go from that to suddenly this decision that are you going in Walmart and is it going to be much bigger than you thought? It was that every time we dropped a weed all off at a shop, they would sell out. Like if I dropped off really? the, from the very beginning at giant robot store, we would drop off 10. They were gone in a day. Like the very first batch of 10 or 20, uh, I think I dropped them off on the Friday. By Sunday afternoon, I got an email from the owner, Eric Nakamura. Hey, you have any more ugly dolls? You know, they're gone. Yeah. Oh. And it was horrifying because in the beginning, uh, Sunman was making them by hand. Uh, so I was like, well, I can't just like, you know, oh, here's 200 more. You know, it was, the, the original plan, I mean, originally was just get them on the shelf and we'll figure out a way to, you know, use that somehow, right? That we're literally between uh, Murakami plush and like this cause stuff out of, out of uh, from Medicom toy. And they just kept disappearing. We would drop off 30 or 40, and then that would just take an extra day longer, but that they consistently sold very well. Uh, and we still kind of use that metric or that, uh, you know, whenever we come up with something new, if it's not working that well, then then you know, is it because of where we put it? Nah, it's probably because it's just not resonating, you know, and to, to kind of cut it as quickly as possible. So if you do your research, we have a lot of, we have a lot of other characters that did not survive the first <laughs> the first round or so. That is super interesting. So what's the process then that you go through? Because um, I suspect this is probably quite relevant to different iterate. I mean, we've already seen certain NFTs like update different IPs, like adjust over time. We've seen certain NFT IPs like try and do seasons and like, okay, well, this is the best of this. We're going to adapt. What was your thought process? then when you had to say like okay this one's not working 
like what was the criteria for saying yeah yes this one's good to go you mentioned okay things are selling out that's obviously a good sign sure on, on the other side how did you make that decision to to cut things uh with ugly doll specifically it was very interesting the the kind of weirdest looking ones that had the most number of legs and the least number of eyes and the most bizarre shapes were the ones that got all the press and really? that, and and seemed to uh, bring everybody over like what are these right oh so weird uh, but then they always ended up picking the cute one that looked like an animal more like you know the, oh but this one and and then that's the one that actually so. The, the other one's just helpful from a marketing standpoint. Then. Yeah, yeah. So we always made sure in every assortment to have one that was literally designed not to sell as well. And, you know, we would wow. short pick it so that there'd be somebody, you know, you, know, you get the emo kid <laughs> to pick it up. But, you know, like uh, th those bizarre ones that everyone seemed to focus so much on were were not necessarily the great. They, they were what brought you over, but it wasn't they weren't. So sometimes you're the ones that do OK can serve another purpose but in general there were some you know we would we would really just introduce new storylines through through products and and the two that resonated the most the, well there were three there was a uh, bossy bear which was started as our uh, a disney kids book series from maybe almost 20 years ago mm -hmm. uh, that became our best-selling plastic toy uh by, by far and then the the ugly doll stuff um it, it appeared to be a, a plush line right the plush were People say, "Oh, they're everywhere, right?" Uh, but we were primarily selling bags and and ceramics, like mugs and and things that were a little more useful. Um, a lot of the, and I'm pointing to like the little mini ones that hang from your your bag. Did always, I mean, every everything did very well. But you know, uh, many people think of it as plush, but really we were like, especially in Japan and Korea, moving lots of other. Very lots interesting. Of that's so interesting. Look, I, I'm conscious of time. I've only got 20 minutes left. So I, I want to kind of shift over to the Web3 side of things and how you maybe took some of this success, took some of this inspiration that you'd already experienced in your career before and wanted to apply to it, apl apply it to Web3. Um, so if you want to speak to to that move that you made. Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, I was developing uh, Bossy Bear as a TV show, when when I first found uh, Web3, we had just signed with Imagine Entertainment, which is the production company run by Ron Howard and Brian Grazer, which I've been big fans of forever. Um, and then together we developed it and pitched it to Nickelodeon and they took it almost right away. So my Web3 journey and the show development process was sort of running simultaneously. And the people at Imagine were, very curious, like well, what is, what do you see? What did you, did I just hear you say that um, you were able to sell a JPEG of uh, your artwork to somebody? Do you mean not a, not the artwork or how? What is it? And so then, you know, <laughs> hilarity ensued. But then we we did a deal to uh, develop shows based on our NFT collections, and this was at the end of 2022. Um, okay. At the same time, many collections were announcing very. Um, web two legacy world achievements which confused me like i was i was i told our fans and so i think i retweeted that you know there's a there's a variety article or something about developing the show but developing a show and having a show really um hit the airwaves are two very different two very different things I and mean, we we've had shows in development always like for the last 20 years uh, i think we've always at least had one show in development with some major studio um it didn't necessarily, it meant, I hope, I hope there will be a show that would be nice, but it's not the default outcome, I'll say, right? Okay. Um, it's very fortunate to be able to get to that point. It's, it's a blessing. And, you know, you get to work with the masters of that universe. It's wonderful. But I suddenly was hearing some collections announce like, oh, we signed CAA. Mm. And I thought, eh, well, um, why, why? You guys are working on like the future. I, CAA is wonderful and they're genius and they're brilliant. Um, I had an agent with them there at the time when I was hearing this and I thought, oh, but I thought this is like um, Uber announcing that they they did a collab <laughs> with like yellow cabs or something. Well, well, I thought you guys are Uber. I thought the cabs are going away. What yeah. happened to, you know? So so it was confusing for a little while. 
because then I was confused by the announcements. Like, oh damn, I guess I should have announced that I signed with them. I didn't. <laughs> well, how did you that, how did you end up making sense of it then? Like, did it ever start making sense to you? Or do you think people were just going down the wrong path? What was? How did you kind of make sense of it? In the end? Uh, there's no way to know what you know what path is wrong until it plays out, anyway. Uh, but but it did start to remind me again of the designer toy movement, where we in the beginning it felt like we're going to change the entire toy industry. But then um, Disney started knocking on you know like if this one creator had great success, they got a Nike collab deal. Uh, Michael Lau got a big Nike thing. And then um, right away, other creators started getting um, development deals from uh, Nickelodeon and Disney. And you know, that's an emotional thing when you're just a person and you, you just make something and you show up at a little table at Comic-Con and then suddenly these major corporations know you and call you by your first name. It's bizarre. It's a very strange feeling. So when I started to hear like, oh, now Time Magazine is coming and oh, uh, uh, now um, the, you know these other major brand uh, things popping up. It just reminded me of that. What happened with the designer toy thing is actually most people got very distracted. These creators who were forging these new paths forward through unexplored territory, about to flip perhaps the industry itself, um, very much dropped the ball back then when, you know, in, in our day and, and kind of became sidetracked by, because developing a show, it's a massive, it's a massive undertaking. It just takes up minutes you don't even have right um so how are you supposed to change the world with web3 when you're now uh you know burdened by this incredible process but uh, i couldn't imagine you know having been developing a show while trying to figure out web3 i was i was you know i would i would come out of the office every day and my kids are like do you have a time machine in there that like rapidly ages you like is it where <laughs> what is happening to you <laughs> you know uh how, how did your time like going through the web three stuff compare to your other stuff? Like, would you say it was markedly more intense, more stressful, the same? Uh, I, I think the, the web, you know, for all of us, web three came when, you know, the lockdowns and all this very, very bizarre time in everybody's life. So it was sort of a major, uh, I think it was a major lifeboat for so many like uh, creatively, uh, for some financially, uh, mm. for some, it was no lifeboat. It was like, you know, the QE2, like just <laughs> a major cruise ship out of whatever, wherever they were sailing previously. Right. Yeah. But, but I, 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 it's funny. Cause like, I was like, well, okay. I'm actually connecting with people on social media now for the first time. It's not just get some likes and yeah, broadcast some news of stuff we have coming out, but that sure. I, I actually started to form these, real human connections with people with pixelated anonymous names and, <laughs> and, and PFP pictures. Uh, I, I, I do still think that Web3, we're going to see a, a lot of brands in Web3 become uh, monsters in, in, in the real world. And I think that perhaps, perhaps that will attract others towards Web3. I, I, I keep kind of defaulting to Takashi Murakami, where he has the attention of a, a good chunk of the planet uh, and and he has the most successful and web3 consumer product like he has that that nft uh keychain that selling at the moment like they can't keep that thing in stock right it's amazing mm. so but then his floor price is like 0 0.02 something i don't know like the murakami flowers i don't know and is that is his connection to it bringing anyone so I, i'm i i toil you know i toss uh, in turn on on that dynamic all the time yeah it's, it's really interesting you mentioned like you think there'll be some web3 monsters coming out in the future in terms of building brand do you think this is ultimately the way to build brand now like because and, and you also said how it was the first time and this is really interesting because at the same time for me as well i'd never really even used social media before but the way that community is formed via these pixelated jpegs and the affiliation that you have with people as a consequence of the ones that you buy into that does seem to be some type of shift in the way that community is built but obviously you, you've been part of the business where you didn't need to do that necessarily you didn't need to do that to build a brand necessarily you didn't need to do that to be successful it seems to be an option now do you necessarily need to to do that i don't know i would love to hear your kind of perspective now is like, has this kind of changed the game? Are we just operating in a different universe now 
where this is the way to start, like with this leverage that you're going to get from 5,000 super fans to, to push you on? Like, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, uh, it, I'm very curious as to how, you know, the near and, and, and long-term future will play out. I remember right when I was telling you the designer toy creators who were like the blue chips of our day became quite distracted. And then yes. this little bobblehead company that had always wanted to join up with everybody else in the uh, um, the designer toy community, but was never really acknowledged as one of the front runners, um, became the front runner. It was a little company called Funko. Um, this guy, oh, Brian, wow. had bought it from another guy we knew named Brian. And we were one of the very first Funko Pops ever, uh, 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 our ugly doll brand, uh, when, it, when, it, when he first started. And he just took the ball that uh, many of these independent toy creators dropped and, and ran with it and became phenomenally successful. I, I do think that some brands in Web3 are about to be the, you know, the Funko equivalent. Uh, you know, uh, but we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. It's starting to re it still reminds me of, of those days very much. And then and then, of course, Pop Mart came and snatched the ball out of, uh, you know, Funko's hands and went even further, flipping Mattel's market cap by 2x at some point. Uh, so I think we'll see that, too. So it's I don't think it's necessarily always going to be who you expect. You know, um, hmm. uh, the blue chips that we thought were the in the lead back then ended up not at all being it, it just happened differently than we all thought it would and i'm curious to see how how it plays out here it's fascinating very, very interesting i, I want to get to some personal questions i'm conscious we only have 12 minutes left but one of the things you mentioned there's like how certain people kind of came out of nowhere overtook the incumbents and then someone else comes like from your perspective and being in that unique position you were to see that happen like what was the stimulus for that what gave those people the momentum to rise up because i think there's a lot of projects right now and i interview a lot of the founders of them who think for whatever reason that you know there are certain projects that get all the limelight there's certain projects that have a higher floor price and therefore get more attention what about us when we're doing good things like what are some of the things that you noticed previously where those people who maybe had less limelight at one point in time were able to really shoot up and you know, catch, catch the world by surprise in some respect. Of course. I'll, I'll try to um, not, I'll, I'm going to avoid mentioning any of these <laughs> uh, uh, projects uh, just because then I start blurting out random ones that I'm, I'm uh, uh, you know, I gravitate towards. Sure. Uh, anger those who I care deeply for. So, uh, but, but I will say that there are, there are some right now that really, it reminds me a lot of just every step that we've taken towards, you know, propelling our, trying to propel ourselves towards, you know, where, where we're ultimately trying to go. Um, many of them remind me of what we saw even with um, brands like Snoopy. Everyone thinks they know what Snoopy is. Hmm. And everyone thinks that Snoopy is successful just because it's Snoopy. Uh, and it, it's far, it, you couldn't be, it's, it couldn't be farther from the truth. I mean, Snoopy was, you know, almost completely wiped out back right after it was like in 2015 or so when the movie came out and the, I think the original owners or the, the, the second owners at that point um, sold most of it off or whatever it was, but Sony bought in maybe 38 to 40% of it. Um, and, you know, they, they turned that thing around. It's like a monster now. Mm. Um, and a lot of the moves that they made, to sort of bring it back to life. I, I see versions of that playing out, you know, now. Yes, then. That, that reminded remind me of, uh, of not, not specific the same moves, but more the, the thought process behind it. I wish I could get more specific without revealing, you know, that is just what I see anyway. What do I know? Uh, but maybe, maybe what, what did Sony do then? Like, what did Sony do if you can't speak about the, the Web3 projects? Maybe yeah. from that perspective would be interesting. So I think before the movie like snoopy originally came right they came and i'll be quick with, with this they they came they were a they were a newspaper comic print you know a comic strip right and yeah, then exactly. after that they sort of transformed into you knew it as the uh, holiday special when i was a kid like the christmas special and the, the, the there's a halloween one the great pumpkin etc then they became a sort of like uh, associated with macy's and uh metlife and 
uh, the Snoo Snoopy snow cone machine. It went through all this, these very, very different sort of different journeys until they truly embraced what they are now, which is a hardcore competitor for Sanrio and, and Hello Kitty and, and all of the other characters in that business. And I, I see, uh, and you know, so if you go to the, the, Sno the Japanese website and just go to the bottom of the page, you can literally track Snoopy's journey from going years back if you want to. You can, you know, deconstruct the whole thing. But I, I see a lot of the movements with more purpose now than I did in 2021, where it felt like it was <laughs> just people trying to figure out what in the world that this world is in the first place. But it, it seems um, that there's far more purpose be behind, uh, you know, these these specific movements with certain collections that, that really give me some uh, uh, hope and and I, I don't think they're distracted at all so I, I think we're going to see it play out in a very positive way soon well that's a that's a nice kind of optimistic uh way to draw towards the conclusion so maybe on that what are you most optimistic for at the moment what are you most excited about uh for yourself in web3 what are you working on the most that's kind of interesting you the most we, we've started working on give it given just my age uh uh, I, I sort of joke about it, but we started working on the last attempt to get a, a feature film made. Uh, we've, you know, we have one show on the air on Nickelodeon. We had one show on the air on NHK in Japan, and we had one um, movie in the th theaters. Um, that one was the, the the movie we had was the I think the top three or fourth worst performing animated motion picture of all time. Oh, wow. <laughs> So I'm, I'm making another attempt, uh, this time to have more control over it and, and for it to not, not even do better financially, but to be more of exactly what we envision, to try to you know hold on to that and make sure it gets onto the screen. It's about something completely new and who knows how far it will go. But the, the process of trying to get that going from zero uh, is what we're going through right now. And I sort of torn to these collections that I'm mentioning because they're sort of doing the same thing. They're, they've, they've got something and they've got, you know, they're kind of like their core early tribe members surrounding it. Yes. And, and now here comes the time where you really can, and it feels like a few of them really are um, activating something that's gonna propel them, not just into this short term, hey, maybe we get some kind of big announcement, but that really could go for decades or be beyond. I, I, I sort of see that. And uh, that, that's very inspiring. So while, while working on our old clunker, uh, you know, projects, uh, it's, it's very inspiring to see what, what everybody's working on. And, and I still do think that like the bottom hundred on OpenSea and the top 10 on OpenSea are, are still on equal footing. You could get a surprise from just some individual that comes up out of nowhere, which also I think is pretty exciting. And I, when I say OpenSea, does anyone use OpenSea? <laughs> You know, maybe not maybe blur or magic eden magic whatever eden. The top rankings are you know got it um with that in mind like you said like what would be your advice to someone maybe maybe at two points like going from zero to one i think as a creator is very difficult i know from being a writer myself i've written 113 editions of my newsletter now and like at the beginning it's way harder than once you get moving right so what what are some what's some of your advice for the creative people in the audience who are trying to think about how they might get going? And then for those people who are like at one looking to get to five, ten, twenty, a hundred, sure. uh, how how did what are your thoughts? I think the advice might even be similar, is that even if you're at square zero and you need to get to one to two, or if you're at ten and you're trying to figure out how to get to a hundred, I will say that in in my the way I've in my experience, um, living living forever, as far as your brand goes, is is a choice, and it's not something that you're just lucky that it happens. It's uh, it's part of the design, and it's up to you to work it into it. So, in my opinion, being able to identify that this is if this is true for you, if you believe that this is so, and I found out to to be true right away. Like the Hello Kitty and these brands that we grew up with don't are they're not still here just because ever all brands are massively fragile and it can go wrong and does go wrong for many of them many times uh you know they have many many rebirths and deaths hmm. and so know that 
you're building something great and the announcements are great and keeping holders happy is wonderful, but that a lot of you are, are onto something that really could literally outlive, outlive you. Mm -hmm. And that it's usually done by design. It's very rare. It rarely happens by accident. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen it happen just because. Uh, so I think knowing that it, it certainly helps me uh, navigate the short term waters and sort of forget about things that pop up that sound great now, but, how does that affect me, you know, 20 years from now? Look, do you know, what? I think that's such a nice, that's actually a really empowering message because it's like, look, by chance, scrambling around, you're probably not going to be able to do it, but it's actually in your hands. Like if you design it thoughtfully, if you approach it every single day and you take it seriously, I think that's a nice empowering message to say that, yes, you are in control. You can design it to the proper way uh, to be successful. So I think that's um, an awesome piece of advice to draw to a conclusion on uh this has been a fantastic discussion but we are close to running out of time uh david we'll just get we'll get people uh, all of your details so people know how to keep uh up to date with everything you're doing in just a moment but before we do that we have to get today's po app into your hands it's designed by timpas himself it's the final po app of the whole season of season two because next week we'll be doing a live raffle uh, on the show so we'll get the poap into your hands uh, it includes our special guest david himself and you can access it in just a moment but just before we get that poap to you we just want to shout out one more time our sponsor for season two cedify the big player in the gaming world they're not just another name in the game they're leading the pack with the highest market cap in the gaming launchpad scene right now they've got two killer nft collections mounts and vanguards only 3110 and 6,000 of these gems exist. So if you're up for staying ahead of the game, now's the time to get involved. We're super excited and hyped to have them as a Chimpreneurship partner. And you can join the Seed World community by picking up the NFTs on your favorite ETH marketplace right now, whether that's OpenSea, whether that is Magic Eden, or anywhere else. Um, back to today's Poap claim, you need to go to poap.xyz, uh, download the app and hit the mint button in the right-hand corner after which you need to enter this secret word. Now it's, uh, it's. I think it's 1.59 Eastern time right now. There's one minute left. It's going to go live in 60 seconds. So the secret word is bossy, B-O-S-S-Y, all lowercase. The secret word is bossy. One more time, B-O-S-S-Y, all lowercase. If you have any issues, you can jump into the Chimpers Discord and raise a ticket, and someone from the team will be able to assist you quickly. Uh, David, as that claim is about to go live and people will be able to claim, where can we go to keep uh, up to date with all things that you are up to? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, on, on my Twitter's bio, there's a link. It's really hard now. X or Twitter makes it impossible to share the uh, Substack link. Oh, it's so difficult. I, I I can never share anymore. I just have to say link yeah. in my bio. Yeah, I, I think even now the algorithm is looking for link in bio. So I'm always trying to think of clever ways. But <laughs> I, it's all, the link is there in my bio. And um, it's it's about once a week, but sometimes three times a week, I, I'll put down my, my goal is to put on paper everything that we've done and try to explain exactly how it is that we got to that point, whether it's making a TV show or getting children's books published um, and why we would want a TV show, uh, because those don't always really do anything, uh, you know, and, and it can sometimes be a hindrance. So all, all the little funny nooks and crannies of our experience, I, I put down on paper for anyone who's interested in starting a character brand. Amazing. I would definitely uh, check that out. Definitely follow David, definitely uh, subscribe to the Substack and that brings us to the conclusion of the show david thank you so much for joining us we're delighted to have brought you chimpanership remember this it will be the final season a final episode of the season next week and keep collecting your poaps to be entered into the raffle the claim is live now thanks so much david appreciate you joining us thank you thanks so much much appreciate it take care everyone we will see you next week have a great day bye bye